Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. The Public Art Fund New York is kicking off their 40th anniversary with their biggest public art exhibition, Good Fences Make Good Neighbors. More than 300 works by Chinese dissident artist Ai Weiwei are on display throughout the city, including the artwork behind me, the arch, right here in Washington Square Park. We'll have more on the artist and his controversial works coming up, but first, here's a look at what's ahead. It's the year of the dog, and Tina Beth Pina gets the stamp of approval by artist Cam Mack. Kyung Yoon looks at how museums are using art to help immigrants become U.S. citizens. Vegan compassion fashion. It's not just what you eat, it's what you wear. Minnie Rowe visits the world's first vegan fashion house. This and more on Asian American Life. When Chinese artist Ai Weiwei lived in New York City in the 80s and 90s, he often came here to Washington Square Park, now the site of the Arch, one of the many installations in his exhibit focusing on the global refugee crisis. Here's how this artist is taking the art world by storm. It's hard to miss a giant 24-foot gold birdcage at the entrance of Central Park at 59th Street. The Gilded Cage is one of more than 300 installations by contemporary Chinese artist Ai Weiwei, part of a broad multimedia project spanning all five New York City boroughs. It was an enormous amount of, of artistic development. Ai Weiwei is an extraordinarily creative and, and fertile artist, so it actually wasn't a problem for him to come up with so many different works. In fact, I had to sort of tell him, like, enough, stop, like, we, we can't do any more. Nicholas Baum is chief curator with New York's Public Art Fund, a nonprofit that organized the massive exhibit called Good Fences Make Good Neighbors, a line borrowed from a famous Robert Frost poem. In this project, the fences, in the form of cages, gates, netting, and yes, fences, symbolize borders and walls, both physical and metaphorical, that are meant to keep out others like foreigners, immigrants, and refugees. According to the United Nations, the number of refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced people is more than 65 million worldwide. Ai Weiwei's mission is to put a spotlight on the global refugee crisis. It's also the subject of his latest documentary, Human Flow. The more immune you are to people's suffering, that's very, very dangerous. It's critical for us to maintain this humanity. He's become very involved in the global refugee crisis and has spent an enormous amount of time visiting refugee camps, going to borders um, around the world, and, and seeing this tremendous um, human flow, as he called it in his documentary, that looks at this crisis. He decided to take this very simple idea of the fence but he kept seeing, you know, these camps fenced in, these borders fencing people off from each other, and wanted to create a sculptural installation and a series of variations on that formal idea of a fence. All of these different ideas about a fence and how it could emerge woven into the fabric of the city of New York. Ai Weiwei's empathy for refugees stems from his own experiences. His father was exiled by the Chinese government and the family sent to a labor camp when Ai Weiwei was a little boy. Then in 2011, the outspoken artist, who is quite critical of the government, was arrested by Chinese officials and spent several months in jail. It was not until 2015 he was allowed to travel outside China. And that's when planning began for his New York exhibit. The artist, who now lives mostly in Berlin, knows New York City very well. He lived here in the 80s and 90s. 
Public art provides a platform for people consciously or unconsciously to be involved. I think we should use the city as a strong instrument to change the environment of the public life. Along with the gilded cage, there's a steel cage under the Washington Square Park arch, circle fence in Flushing Meadows Corona Park, two-dimensional banners hanging from 200 lampposts, and installations at bus shelters and between buildings. You may not even realize you're seeing the work of one of the world's most famous contemporary artists of our time. The location of his installations are deliberate. Looming south of the Gilded Cage is a famous gold tower, Trump Tower. Ai Weiwei is a staunch critic of the president's anti-immigration policies and his promise to build a wall between the U.S. and Mexico. He hopes his cage sends a message. I don't think there's any other artist in the world that inhabits this very special place where he is you know, one of the most important contemporary artists internationally, but also one of the world's leading spokesmen on human rights and someone with the moral authority of having himself, you know, been a dissident standing up to the, the Chinese regime. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary combination of, of this sort of civic and public engagement and the creative vision that he brings. For Asian American Life, I'm Ernabel DeMillo. I'm Tina Beth Pina. You're about to meet an artist from Brooklyn who has literally put his own stamp on the Lunar New Year stamp series. I'm most proud of that I have the acceptance of my community that, that they they are happy with the series. The Lunar New Year stamp series has been around for 26 years, and Brooklyn's Cam Mack is only the second artist commissioned to illustrate the stamps. There's a lot of pressure, and the pressure comes from my community, and the pressures that I have to live up to um, everyone's expectation. They already seen the first one. It is very nerve-wracking because it's not just me illustrating a, a book, because what I'm sharing, what's the image that I'm sharing on the stamp is representing all the people who celebrate the Lunar New Year. There's also this other expecta expectation uh, with the stamp because um, I think many people don't know the history, how the stamp came about with the U.S. Postal Service. There's a story behind it. The stamp series was inspired by the Organization of Chinese Americans, or OCA, who urged the U.S. Postal Service back in the 80s to issue a stamp honoring the contributions of Asian Americans to the U.S. Artist Clarence Lee illustrated the first Lunar New Year stamp series in 1992, which included all 12 traditional animal signs. Mac followed in 2008 with a series that to this day emphasizes holiday traditions. I looked at the previous series, of course, also uh, I looked at what the Lunar New Year stamp looks like in China, in New Zealand, in Canada. Their similarity is that they use the Chinese zodiac, the animal, as the central concept for the Lunar New Year. So, so I did the same. It's not just about the 12 animals, it's more than that. It's, it, those images Every one of them have stories about those Lunar New Year elements. The Red Lantern, that's something that my mother always, right before the Lunar New, New Year, she will take them out and decorate on the window sills, you know. And, and in Chinatown, you see red everywhere, Red Lantern hanging in front of all the business, the Narcissus flower. And I would help my grandma in Hong Kong to kind of set it up. And when it blossoms, that smell, that very sweet fragrance of that flower is, you never forget it. So I grew up with that. So just getting a whiff of that fragrance, that bring me back to the whole memory of my grandmother. And, and that is Chinese New Year. 
This year's souvenir stamp celebrates the Year of the Dog and like past designs, incorporates elements of Asian traditions in the illustration. Are there particular design methods that you use when you're creating these stamps? The way I work is on oil paints, and so that's what I did. And so I usually get a pretty uh, tight drawing I did, and then I transfer that onto a panel, and then I'll, I'll paint directly on top of it. Yeah, it's like each, each of the design takes me about two months, two and a half months. Some of them take longer because of revisions. Do you have to take in consideration like how small the stamp is when you're painting? Because you're painting on a larger canvas, but the stamp yeah. is so small. Uh, yes, it's very difficult actually to, to design a stamp because everything needs to be seen in such a small size. Usually while I'm working, I take a picture of it and I reduce it down and I can see what is lost if it's reduced. And I go in and put more contrast I zoom in closer to things with my composition so that the image has much more impact. In addition to illustrating stamps, Mac is also an author, painter, and teacher at the Fashion Institute of Technology. He's very happy that his mom now approves of his artistic career choice and the success of the stamp series. But she was so proud. She said, oh my God, so she, and she took, she cut out the paper. She went to her senior citizen home where she hangs out and she just show off to everyone, that's my son. I mean, definitely it's not something I'm used to, but, but I'm so happy that there's something that I did in my career that my mother can appreciate. Could you imagine when you were a little boy coming from Hong Kong to Chinatown, that this would be your life right now? Oh man, so emotional to think about that. Never, I, ne I mean, I knew where I came from. I think that I'm just very fortunate that uh, the path, the journey I went through, every time I come into an obstacle, <laughs> there is always someone there, just in the right time to just take me up lift me up <laughs> and I knew what I wanted to do. I know I can, there's nothing else I prefer to do except making pictures and so I'm very fortunate. Cam has already illustrated a 2019 stamp which is the final stamp of his series. His bore illustration is awaiting final approval from the U.S. Postal Service. For Asian American Life, I'm Tina Beth Pina. Kyung Yoon, we all know the difference between studying from a textbook and the chance to touch and experience what we're learning firsthand. Well, here at the New York Historical Society, they have a new program for people hoping to become U.S. citizens that takes exactly that approach. Ya Yun Tang works at the Museum of Chinese in America in Lower Manhattan, and she knows a thing or two about this country's history. But when it came time for the Taiwanese native to apply for U.S. citizenship, she sought out help from the New York Historical Society. I didn't grow up in the United States. I came here after I graduated from um, university in Taiwan. Um, so I never really had a, you know, overview of um, American history. Ya Yun was one of the first to enroll in the New York Historical Society's Citizenship Project. The innovative and interactive program uses paintings and artifacts from the museum's collection to teach to the questions on the citizenship test that require a deep knowledge of American history. The curriculum was developed by Samantha Rikers, who manages the program. We find it so much easier to answer and to memorize these questions if you know the story behind it. So that's how I started, just looking through our collections. Students take part in a 32-hour program that uses the museum as a classroom, taking them into galleries to examine objects, documents, and artworks. A lot of it revolves around feeling the object talking about this object and uh, try to make sense um, why there is this label on it or why there's this interesting smell, what is it, right? And then um, the educator will facilitate the conversation and uh, tell us what it is and how it's being used and why, you know, it exists at that time period. So it's a lot of like touching, thinking, talking, and it's really exciting, you know, when you think about learning, it's not just sitting in a classroom and then 
have you know papers and uh, books and then you're just trying to remember information. It's a lot of hands-on activities. For more than 200 years, the New York Historical Society has been a place to explore, among other things, the stories of new immigrants and what it means to be an American. Its chief operating officer, Jennifer Shantz, says that it was the White House travel bans in January of 2017 that prompted the museum's leadership to create the new citizenship project. As part of the program, we developed free education courses to help green card holders pass the USCIS citizen, uh, naturalization test. If you're not a citizen in the United States, um, you don't have the right to vote. It's much more difficult to travel abroad if you end up um, being convicted of a crime, you can be deported more easily. And so this way, I think we're just helping people find more security in the United States. Samantha Rikers is from the Netherlands, and she not only manages the program, she has something in common with its students. I thought it was fascinating that you yourself are in the process of applying for naturalization. So how did that play into designing the program? I started out just by looking at those 100 questions from the naturalization test, of course. And then uh, I looked at our collections and thought which artifacts and which paintings and which documents from our library can we use to teach those questions. For me, what I love the most about museums is um, you can really um, look at an object or you know an artifact or um, a piece of artwork and uh, um, each of them um, comes with so many stories of their own. So I think it's really useful and uh, it really helps me to remember um, what's being taught in the class. Since the program launched in July, it has helped nearly 200 green card holders to prepare for their citizenship test. The goal is to have a thousand participants in its first year. Students are coming from all over the world and speak many different languages. We have students from over 40 different countries, but when they're together in a class, they really bond and they really all have one thing in common. That's that they want to become American citizens and want to learn more about American history. So if we can help people get more integrated into the United States and learn more about who we are and what it means to be an American, I think then we've done a good thing. You also take the program outside the museum. Yes, we also take it outside because we recognize that there are some people who live you know, far from the museum. It's you know, hard for them to come after work. And so we offer to various community-based organizations, for instance, Dominicanos USA. We're working with CUNY Citizenship Now as well, um, and other organizations throughout the city. The Immigration Services has asked the New York Historical Society to work with community groups and museums in other cities that want to establish similar programs. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. I'm Minnie Rowe. Nothing beats the cold of old man winter than a thick wool coat. This may look like it's made with the finest merino wool, but actually not a single animal was used to make this coat. Instead, this is all recycled and organic fibers. It's a revolutionary concept, one that could create a new standard in the fashion industry. Humans have always used animal skin, feather, and fur for clothing and outerwear. From prehistoric times, when people wore them out of necessity to survive, to present day, where it's coveted for its warmth and luxurious qualities. If you wear a fur coat, you're wearing 40 animals. 40 lives per coat. Leanne Mele Hilgard is an avid animal rights supporter and is trying to change the mindset of shoppers everywhere. She created Vote, the world's first vegan outerwear, in an effort to create a coat which was stylish enough to go from day into night, warm enough to withstand the bitter cold winters of Chicago where she grew up, and entirely animal free to align with her beliefs. Hilgard is a strict vegan, meaning she doesn't consume any animal products like meat, eggs, fish, or dairy. No one's really reinvented the winter dress coat. And I would see people who like were in Chicago, terribly cold. They'd either choose to wear a hiking or ski coat, you know, over their dress, over their work clothes. Could I make a dressy winter coat that was also stylish, but warm enough for Chicago winter? 
you know, it could create a positive impact as a business, and it could also then tell the world we don't have to wear animals. The name vote comes from combining V for vegan and haute, as in haute couture or high fashion. Hilgard says every time you wear a vote coat, you are casting a vote for animal rights. The way we've been taught to shop isn't sustainable for the earth, and it's not sustainable for an industry that is, you know, looking at animals as machinery, as cogs. That's why we end up with bad treatment and conditions for animals that are used and raised and killed for their bodies is just because it's an industry where everyone's competing on price. My mission is to take animals out of the fashion equation, to take them out of the business equation, because living beings are not machine parts. Hilgard was modeling in Asia when she came up with the concept for Vote. She put everything on the line to pursue her dream. Even though I didn't know how, and I didn't have a background in fashion, and I can't sew, and we didn't have, I didn't have outside investors, it was the bottom of the recession. I had never even been in a factory, like a cut and sew factory, like I had no clue. But I did know that I had a very strange combination of loving fashion, loving creating art, and wanting to speak up for animals. And that if I could combine those things in a way that could serve the world, then, you know, I could make something that could do my part. So she gave up her Ford modeling contract, a full-ride MBA at DePaul University, and plunged headfirst into 80-hour work weeks to develop and pioneer the first vegan outerwear line. I also kind of thought people were gonna think I'm crazy. If I explain it's vegan outerwear, people are like, and people said, like, you can eat it? Like, what does that mean? Her coats are made from innovative textiles like Primaloft, which Arctic explorers and NASA astronauts wear, recycled plastic bottles salvaged from landfills, and organic fibers spun from plants like cotton, hemp, and soy. Every coat she sells is made right here in the United States, in factories that provide a living wage for its workers, artisans who are responsible for creating an entire coat as opposed to an assembly line method typically found in sweatshops. This is the Emily. And uh, yeah, this has the um, zipper as well as a zip off hood. Christiana is a longtime Vote customer and a model who loves the slimming style and classic look of the Vote pieces. But she especially loves it because she says it makes her feel like she's making a tangible difference in the world. Like I feel like it's a fashion brand that's bigger than us with a message, if it makes any sense. So when I, when I wear it, I know I'm casting a vote to something that's important for humanity. Humanity aside, how well does the vote coat work? We brought them here to minus five experience, where the temperature that day was a frigid 18 degrees Fahrenheit inside the frozen room and compared it against my own wool coat. All right, so I was in there for about 15 minutes and it's super cold in my coat. So now I'm gonna try on Leanne's coat and see how that one works out. Hi, right, here I go. Now, this is by no means a scientific test. Inside Minus 5 Experience, there is no humidity and no wind, so it's not quite like being in the outdoors. Not to mention, feeling cold is purely subjective. After a while, I definitely began to feel the chill in certain parts of my body. I don't want to move. I'm getting a little cold. 15 minutes later, I think that this coat works really well because my core is very warm. The only place where I'm feeling a little cold is right in my legs and a little bit in my arm. I also tried on the Lincoln, which looks more like a traditional down-filled long coat. Full length insulated. Okay. Um, A-line. I could tell the difference almost immediately. This is warm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is definitely warm. Like most pioneers, Hilgard had her share of skeptics in the industry when she first launched her line. When I first said, you know, I have a vegan fashion line, some people in the fashion industry wouldn't even look at it. Just hearing that, they would be like, not for us, sorry. And they wouldn't even want to see what it looked like. Now in its ninth year, she is making tracks in the fashion industry, building up a loyal following. Celebrities are also starting to embrace her line, and accolades are pouring in. Hilgard hopes to revolutionize the entire fashion culture, one coat at a time.
The market is no longer how many vegans want a beautiful winter coat. The market is now how many people live in cold cities who want to look stylish and be warm at the same time. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. Be sure to visit Ai Weiwei's exhibit, Good Fences Make Good Neighbors, on display throughout the city, including here at Washington Square Park. If you want more information on the exhibit and all our stories, follow us on Facebook at Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We'll see you next time.